you asked for financial information from Parkers. It was deemed premature because it related to punitive damages, correct? It, it, it was different than the motion that it related to Ellie. Because the law is how much money you have is a factor for punitive damages, correct? Well, you, you're – you're making statements of law. I'm telling you what was happening, and what was happening was is that Ellick's lawyers knew what the evidence was. They knew what the amendment was going to be and the allegations, and he knew ultimately he was going to be back in front of Judge Hall making some ridiculous argument that I appears you're suggesting now. And, again, the gist of this is that there was – perhaps going to be this judgment day, I think is a term the state has used, but that was going to be trial, right? That was going to be the verdict. That was going to be judgment day, not this motion hearing where there's a pile of motions that have piled up, and we saw the one that asked for financial information was deemed premature. Not, not at all. You know, what was going on is, as, as I've said a number of times, Danny Henderson was very involved. Danny Henderson was a shareholder. Before I would have gotten the bank account information, before I would have seen the records, Danny Henderson would have seen those records. And I've seen the records. I've seen all the bank statements now. It would have been apparent to Danny Henderson, and I believe it would have been apparent to me uh, what Alec had been doing. So that's the judgment day, is the discovery. And there were a lot of threads that were being pulled, uh, and it was subject to unraveling at any moment. And if those records were disclosed. If Danny Henderson reviewed those records, he would have known there's no way Alex getting these checks. There's no way these checks are going to forge. There's no way that this money should be transferred. And even if, hypothetically, had this hearing on the 10th and you got a different ruling um, regarding uh, Alex Murdoch than you got against Parkers, that for some reason it's not premature to him, isn't it true all you would have been Enable, all you could have gotten would have been a, a net worth statement, financial statement? Not, not even remotely close. Isn't that, that you don't, in your opinion, there's no case law out there saying that's what you get, you know, for, that's the measure for punitive damages, net worth. There's no such case in your opinion as an attorney. I had seven circuit court orders where the circuit court had ruled that you don't bifurcate discovery, that it wouldn't be proper to have denied the motion and then what are we going to do? We're going to try the case, and suddenly we're going to stop the trial and go and do the discovery? No. And so I had seven circuit court orders that I handed up to Judge Hall that supported our position. I think that that's what Judge Hall did in his order. Uh, and, and, again, you know, the issue is it's not that complicated. It's does he have the ability to pay? Is he broke such that these people sh should uh, accept this pitiful offer if he could cobble it together. But, sir, that's not what you get on a motion to compel, is it? Right. You, you're, you're, you just said ability to pay so your client can make a decision on whether to accept a settlement offer, but that is not what the motion to compel is about, is it? It's about evidence for trial. The motion that's to the compel, legal standard, is it not? No, the motion to compel was about putting pressure on Ellick. I didn't really give two cents about whether or not uh, he ultimately had money because I knew he had money. I didn't need those things. The fact that he didn't want me to have them is the reason that I'm pushing it. So, I just didn't know why he didn't want me to have them at the time. I do now. So the motion to compel was to put pressure on Alex. It wasn't about an expectation the judge was actually going to give you this stuff on, on June 10th? If you're a good plaintiff's lawyer, everything you do in a case is to put pressure on the other side. But the expectation of the outcome of a hearing on June 10th was not that you're going to get to launch a full-scale forensic audit because you had a conversation with someone who said, whose lawyer said, oh, he's, he's broke, and you didn't believe it. Not at that stage of the litigation, sir, is it? That's not what's, what's going to happen, is it? I don't think you need a full-scale forensic audit for something a five-year-old could see. Um, so, no. You wanted pre-trial ability to pay discovery to inform whether or not to accept a, a compulsive discovery, compelled, so that your client could decide whether or not to take a settlement offer. I know you don't like the answer, but I'm telling you, I did not care about the answer. What I cared about was putting pressure on Ellick. I think that your assessment of the law is wrong, and I didn't really care whether I got it at the end of the day. I knew he didn't want me to have it. 
And so that's what I was doing was putting pressure on him. It would have suited me fine not to have ever gotten anything and to leverage it into a settlement and gone on about my way. But that's not what happened. So it was the motion was not about obtaining uh, information that may have been relevant at trial. It was about I, getting information to inform whether or not you want to, your client would take a settlement offer. What I told Judge Hall was, they say he's broke. My people have lived in Hampton their entire lives. They do not believe he's broke. If he's broke, we need to open the books and let them see it so that they can then form a, a, an informed uh, opinion about what they should do. It didn't, it didn't have anything to do with, with the trial. It had to do with the case and resolving the case. And 